Once again, welcome. We are so pleased that you are joining us this evening for our Midcoast Audubon series. And tonight's program with Matthew Young is going to talk about Finch Eruptions and the Finch Research Network. But before we do that, I'm going to turn the program over to our representative here tonight from the Midcoast Audubon Society to tell you a little bit about that organization and to introduce tonight's speaker. Kit Pfeiffer, take it away. Hey, thanks, Julia. I am Kit Pfeiffer. I'm a member of Midcoast Audubon, and I would like to very briefly introduce you to our organization if you don't know us yet. We're all volunteer. We have these free monthly programs. We love our partnership with the Camden Public Library. We hope to offer some birding trips in the spring, maybe with small groups. If we can get to that point, um, we steward several local preserves. If you didn't know about that, we have scholarships for individuals about uh, to attend natural history programs like Hog Island. We provide free birding stations for schools and libraries. That's pretty cool. And you still can meet the deadline of March 30th if you would like to apply to uh, receive a grant to get those materials. It's pretty fun. And all of it's made possible with our membership dues. So if you're not already a member, please consider joining us. We would love it. So Matthew Young, he is president and founder of the Finch Research Network. It's a new nonprofit dedicated to research and education about all things Finch. He lives in central New York and he received his BS in water resources with a minor in meteorology from SUNY Oneonta, did I pronounce it right, Matt? I'm not sure. <laughs> and his, his MS in Ornithology from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University. Matt worked at the infamous, famous Cornell Lab of Ornithology for over 15 years. He took the lead on the lab's first Finch eruptive bird survey back in 1999. And for over a dozen years, he was an audio engineer and collections manager at their Macaulay Library. That's that source of so many incredible bird recordings and photographs that we enjoy at the um, website yeah. All About Birds. And he's been a tour guide leader for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, written finch species accounts for various bird atlases, published several papers about the red crossbill, vocal complex. We'll hear more about that, won't we, Matt? So here's our well, Finch guy from somewhere out in the Midwest in a <laughs> Subway store, and he will take us deeper into the world of these special birds. It's all yours, Matt. Hi, thank you for that uh, introduction, Kit. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, with everybody. Uh, yeah, it's been an interesting day for uh, those that uh, have not heard. I was trying to fly from uh, New York to uh, Nebraska for the Sandhill Crane Festival. And uh, my flight out of O'Hare got canceled. So uh, I uh, drove across to Iowa and I am in the middle of Iowa at a subway to give this presentation to you right now. So let me um, do a screen share. Uh, can uh, everybody hear me all right? Is that all right? Yes, you sound great. And we can Good. see your screen. Good. All right. Let me, uh, I got to go back to. So, yeah, Finch, Finch eruptions to the launching of the Finch Research Network. Uh, that was me actually when I was leading a Victor Emanuel Nature Tour guide trip in 2014, the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and I, you know, I like to start out at the presentation with kind of giving people, you know, a little bit of insight on how did I end up, you know, with this kind of lifelong passion uh, for finches. It, it, believe it or not, it actually started here at this location. Um, I, I got my degree, as Kit said, in uh, water resources and meteorology, but uh, this is Lower Falls at Yellowstone. I took a job as a host at the Lake Yellowstone Inn, and uh, I had just bought a pair of binoculars. I had just started becoming a birder in 1995. So I was a little bit late to birding compared to a lot of people nowadays. And uh, I had a flock of birds fly in above me at Lower Falls. And I put my bins on them and looked up and I just said, what an odd looking bird. I knew there were crossbills when I put my bins on them. 
and uh, the seed coats were kind of falling down because they kind of shut the, the seed from the seed coat. And, you know, you never know at the time that moments like that can set you off in a completely different trajectory in your life. And that was clearly one of those moments. Uh, from there, I took a position in uh, the AmeriCorps uh, program. It's like a, for people that may not know, it's a domestic-based Peace Corps. And that's really where my, uh, my interest in, in uh, birding career kind of started to take off. Um, I would do these snowshoe treks into, into these wilderness areas. We were actually looking at, I was going in to look at can carnivore camera sets for uh, Canada lynx and pine martens. And it was on those um, walks that, you know, the, there was a few species that were always, always consistent on those trips. And there were siskins and evening grosbeaks and, and red cross bells. They became kind of my, my friends on those trips. Uh, but just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea what captivated me so much um, was, you know, that feeding mechanism. So I'm going to play this video here for you of a cr the crossbill feeding mechanism. Of the 10,000 bird species on Earth, only five, all in the finch family, have crossed bills. The white-winged crossbill is found in the higher latitudes of North America, traveling from coast to coast in large flocks in search of white spruce trees. Females are greenish yellow, males red, and both have two distinct white bars on the wings. Their unique crossed bill, with the lower mandible curving under the upper maxilla, is adapted to reach heavily protected seeds found under tough cone scales. To reach the seeds, a white wing places the tip of the curved lower mandible against the cone, while inserting the upper maxilla under the scale. Beak partially open, the bird uses the curved mandible as a lever, twisting his head as he pries up the scale. He eats the seed, discarding the husk. The curve of the mandible provides the leverage needed to force the scale up, enabling crossbills to feed on seeds that are not accessible to other species. A white wing often so twists the, the cone off and from... carries it to a perch where it holds the cone in one claw and rotates it like a corn cob. Lower mandibles cross either left or right, and each individual always holds the cone in the claw toward which their mandible curves. This ensures that the tip of the mandible is facing the cone, giving the bird the best leverage to quickly pluck the seeds. White wings are remarkably efficient at harvesting their food. An individual bird can eat up to 3,000 evolutionary adaptation. So those are seed coats falling from other birds up above. You can kind of see them raining down from time to time. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of where I was, uh, you know, that captivated me and kind of changed my whole life. Uh, you don't know it at the time, but, you know, sometimes you have these moments that just grab you. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're 20 something years later, 25, 26 years later, um, you know, studying finches. So, you know, this year's super flight um, and, you know, the, the definition of a super flight really you know, it's been around a while actually um, and you have to have all eight of the eastern eruptive finches to move into the southern zone of their eruptive or their wintering area um, to kind of define uh, you know be defined as a super flight you know and what led to that so i'm going to actually just show you some maps um, for all of these eight species um, from october to march and you can see the extent of this invasion that is accurate. Pine siskins were on Bermuda. 
they were also down in the uh, Everglades. And you can see here that the highest densities were actually in the southern part of the zone of north of eastern North America, Texas, you know, Georgia, the Carolinas. Similar thing with purple finches, you can see the, the, the highest densities down here in the south, and they also made it into central Florida. Red poles, you know, this, uh, we kind of knew something was probably going to be going on with red poles. Because we had, uh, you know, believe it or not, two sightings came in from New Mexico in October. Um, but there was a scattering of red poles. Obviously, red poles are most, uh, the densest numbers are in the northern parts of the states um, and, you know, southern Canada as well. But, you know, there's been records this year in Missouri and Arkansas and the Carolinas. And then the hoary red pole, you know, there's there's been, uh, you know, we started a, uh, you know, the Finch, the Finch Research Network, we have two Facebook pages, one the Finch Masters, which is the business page. And then we have a, a discussion board called the Finch's Eruptions and Mass Crops. I suspect some people that are uh, on tonight are part of that group, um, but it's been, we've kind of joked about red poles uh, creating, hoary red pole in particular, creating this red pole fever because it's just been nonstop flow of, can you ID to see if this is a hoary red pole? in this photo. Uh, crossbills, uh, you know, mainly this eastern type is the one that's been moving around the most in the east. But again, it's been a, a pretty spectacular flight. Um, this bird moved farther south than I've seen it in the 20 years. I've been looking at this particular northeastern bird. White wing crossbills are probably the one that didn't move in the greatest numbers. But still, you could see that there were a scattering of consistent records throughout the East. Uh, no huge, huge numbers. Certainly some big numbers in the Western Great Lakes. Uh, Hawk Ridge or near Hawk Ridge had a, uh, a day that they broke, uh, I believe, the count record uh, for a single day for white wing crossbills back in October. Pine Grove Peak's the most, most kind of northern, or at least has the most northern southern limits of of any of the eruptive finches uh they, they you know had an eruption that's one of the best in the last 10 years as well um they were i i suspect maine probably had quite a few pine gross beaks because they are more northern um in new york they kind of the stronghold of them uh kind of ended right about the albany area and then evening grows peaks, the darlings of the finches. There were there were three different records. I got a recording. In fact, I got two recordings now in the last week. I got one from Central Florida, and I'm in the process now of listening to what I believe is actually a recording of one from Louisiana. And there has not been an, an evening grows peak record in Louisiana, if it's if it's confirmed. And I think it is one uh, since 1986. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing eruption. And we're just now getting into this next topic. Um, we're just now getting into the return flight of this uh, massive eruption that we've seen this past year. It's kind of helped us all cope with this uh, pandemic that we've been dealing with. But, you know, what led to this super flight? It's kind of a, a combination of a number of events that kind of came together. Um, and the big ones were really really great generational cone crops on conifers. When I say generational, you know, best cone crop in 20 years kind of thing. And a blossoming, continued blossoming spruce budworm outbreak um, throughout Quebec and Ontario. Um, so the generational cone crops led to high reproductive success in the cone uh, or the seed eating finches, the crossbills, siskin, as well, and as far as the spruce budworm outbreak, and a lot of people don't think of, you know, they think of budworm specialists, they think of Tennessee warbler and Cape May warbler, um, maybe, you know, bay-breasted warbler kind of thing. Believe it or not, uh, a few of the fishes are pretty specialized on budworm, spruce budworm, evening grosbeak being one of them, purple finch being another one, and even pine siskin to some degree. And, and even all of the finches to some degree will utilize budworm. Um, if there is a, an abundant 
a protein rich, easily accessible resource, birds are gonna utilize it. I mean, most birds, any birds are, are opportunistic. So evening grow speaks, you know, a species of special concern, darlings of the finches, they've kind of uh, decreased uh, 90% since 1970. And we are on the upswing now because of partly, or in large part because of this budworm outbreak. And you can see right there, uh, that was up to 2018. The numbers have fallen off uh, since 1970. I just, uh, at this point, I just wanna, is there any questions at this point uh, that you wanna take, Julia? Uh, no questions have come in yet. There, okay. so you can proceed. Thank you very much. Can you still hear me though, all right? Yes, I can. Uh, if there are any additional videos though, we'd recommend muting because we were hearing a lot of background noise during that. But gotcha. other than that, keep going. It's awesome. Oh, oh, right, here, right. I'm sorry. Gail has put in a question, and she wants to know okay. where where are the finches when they are not erupting? In the boreal forest, mostly. They're, that's what makes them mysterious. Is they're they're coming out of the boreal forest to the north, and they do this in, on a somewhat irregular schedule, and it all has to do with you know when do populations get to the point where they're high enough, and then you know, the food can't support that pop, those populations. And then they move into the Southern states, Southern parts of the states. Um, you know, erupted migration is kind of can be seen as a, you know, kind of defined as a facultative or type of facultative migration. You know, when you, when you say, what is a facultative, what is facultative migration? Uh, ducks are the classic example. Ducks move because of where the ice edge is, basically. If there's open water, there's ducks there. If the, if the lake freezes over, ducks move. So you can kind of think of, of finches in a similar way. If there's food there to support the populations in the boreal, they're perfectly fine uh, staying there. But if the food is not uh, you know, a great enough cone crop or great enough food in general, uh, like pine grosbeaks like to eat fruit, um, those birds are forced to then move. Um, but they don't move like fixed, you know, long-term migrants like a warbler going from Central America or South America back to North, uh, North America. Um, so, Betty, Betty wanted to know if you're going to have any pictures of red poles. Uh, I'm going to have one picture of red pole <laughs> um, more towards the end. Okay. Um, if the, anybody does have questions with red poles, uh, and wants a hoary red pole identified by all means, email me and I will make an assessment on whether you think you have a hoary red pole because that does seem to be uh, one of the things that everybody has really, really wanted help on this year. And I could go over some, some of the tips of, on how to ID red poles at least briefly, but right now I'm just gonna jump into the taxonomy of uh, crossbills and gross beaks. I am going to play some sound in there. There's nobody in here right now. So, um, you know, what is a cold type? Um, it is a, a taxa that is kind of uh, been associated with these crossbills and grosbeaks. A lot of people don't even realize that even grosbeaks have five different cold types. And no, not most of the finches do not have this cold type phenomenon. Um, with crossbills, though, in particular, it's a bit of a Galapagosy finch thing going on where there's you know, like with that flight call, which is what defines the call type, um, comes an, eco, an implied ecological specialization that is tied to slight differences in bill morphology that are suited for feeding on different types of conifer trees in certain areas of North America. So anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play you a spectrograph here. And, you know, this is basically a signature of a bird's voice on how it would you know, look on, on like a piece of paper, but it's a spectrograph. This is normal speed though of a crested or a pendula. Our brains have a hard time processing sound at normal speed, but you can kind of see and keep up with the downward trajectory or, or you know, downward scale of this particular sound. And then I'm gonna play it at half speed and you can really kind of get it then. Did you hear that some at least? Yes, yes we could. 
Good. So you can see the downward. It's almost like somebody's taking their finger over a comb. Here it is at half speed, though. Play one more time. So you can really kind of hear that downward scale. So here are evening gross beaks. I'm not going to talk about evening gross beaks for too long. But you can see I actually have six spectrograms here. And uh, it's partly because we're not sure if there's two different. There might be a six call type embedded in this type three. Um, and you can see I'm not going to play them from that long. But they're pretty different looking. But I understand that I'm in the weeds here you know, identifying things that, you know, not a lot of people would necessarily pick up on. Here's kind of the ranges of them. Uh, type type three is the only type we really get here in the East at all. Type one is the eruptive one throughout the West. Actually, this range map could be continued to Alaska and then also through the Mountain West. There's type one. Very, very clear, thin whistle. It's pretty different than our bird here in the east. And here's type two, which is in the, it's basically a Sierra bird. Pretty different, at least again to my ears. So I understand that's relative. Here's our type three. Pretty explosive sounding. Then type four. So, so cross bills are kind of where this call type phenomenon will really first took, you know, was first described. Jeff Groff in the late 80s and early 90s drove all around North America recording cross bills, you know, capturing them, taking measurements on them. And he described the first eight call types. And here, I'm just going to play. There's no sound with this video, but this is some spectacular feeding video that Tom Johnson took of a red crossbill feeding on a black pine, Japanese black pine. Oh, go back there. I never get tired of looking at this. It's just, it's, uh, wait until you see the tongue come out and grab the seed on this footage. <laughs> Unbelievable. So that tongue sh basically shocks the seed from the seed coat. You know, and getting into the cross bills, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna go into these individualized, but you know, don't, don't, you know, concern yourself with reading all these. These are kind of grouped as they kind of look similarly. So you type one, two, and nine look kind of similar to one another. Uh, type uh, 10, seven, four, they all kind of look a little bit more similar as well. Um, but I'm gonna go into the ones that are most common in Maine in the northeast um but before i do that though i want to just get into this idea of like why you know why even be concerned with this call type phenomenon so in the late 90s a scientist dr bankman at the university of idaho um or actually university of wyoming i'm sorry um asked himself the question of is there a mountain range east of the rockies that uh, had lodgepole pine, but had no tree squirrels. Tree squirrels drive, or pine squirrels drive cone evolution. 
And anyway, you found this, this mountain range in Idaho called the South Hills and Albion Mountains. And he realized when he went there, they, there was an absence of tree squirrels and the abundance or densities of crossbills was much higher than anywhere he had ever uh, witnessed. And he started recording them and realized they were different sounding birds. Um, let me just go back there. And, and, the, and the fascinating thing is, is he was able to over time um, study the morphological difference of the cones in the South Hills versus the on Lodgepole Pine versus the cones on the Lodgepole Pine in the Rockies. And where pine squirrels are present driving cone evolution, the tree was putting more energy into the thicketing of the distal stalk of where the cone actually attaches to the tree. Um, if you take the pine squirrel out of the equation though, the tree was putting more energy into the thickening of the scale of the cone, making it harder for the crossbill to get at the seed. But anyway, he studied this, did a mark recapture study um, for 20 years, almost 20 years, and actually found that these birds were assortatively mating with one another, even though other cold types would fly in and out of that area, types two and five, type nine at the time was correctly choosing other type nines to mate with. And so they were assortatively mating to cold type. So there was a reproductive barrier there. And, you know, between that and the fact that there was this cone evolution difference, the fact that he was actually able to do some genetics on them and found that they were monophyletic and they were a resident population. He proposed them as a new species and they were accepted as a new species three, four years ago as the cash or crossbill. So in the East, we have four really cold types in the East. We have this type one bird that is in the Appalachians. Um, and it is most common to the south of Maine. But I'll play that right now. So it's kind of a hard, a hard descending choop, choop, choop. And you can see the spectrogram there. Now, this is where things get interesting. So Jeff Groth is the one to describe these first eight. He actually missed a couple types. Um, and it's really no fault of his at all. Um, he had only recorded a few of them, but he lumped a couple cold types in with this type four bird, which is largely a Western bird. It is most common in Douglas fir forests on the West Coast. I'll play it for you. We get it rarely. In the east, we get vagrants of this particular bird, and it is a down-up sound. It's a V-shaped spectrogram. It's probably one of the easiest ones to identify, actually, in my opinion. Um, and then about 10 years ago, Ken Irwin found this bird along the West Coast in Sitka Spruce Forest, in the West Coast. And it was just this upward. So you can see here, type four is a down up, type 10 is just an up. And it's pretty thin and pretty different sounding. Again, to my ears, I understand that, you know, I've listened to far too many crossbills for any healthy uh, human being in a lot of ways. Uh, but I'll play it right here. Pretty different sounding, again, in my ears. And then there's this, this bird that we've been calling. People have been, you know, I, I get recordings sent to me all, every day. And, uh, you know, there's this bird I've been calling type 10 or Eastern type 10. Um, and we're still looking at this. In fact, Jeff and I are still looking at this bird. Um, it very well uh, could be a new call type that we are. Uh, on the verge of describing, it's actually been around a long time, just nobody really 
got on this bird, I started seeing it and looking into it and kind of recognizing it as something different a good 20, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and the interesting thing about it um, is, is, you know, there's a decent chance that, the, you know, this bird's always been around somewhat in small numbers, I think, uh, this eastern bird. And I'm going to play it right here. It's pretty different sounding. So it's a down, it's an up down. Pretty kind of squeaky sounding. And this is a bird that moved around a lot this, this past summer um, in the fall as well. Here it is again here. So I was, I was actually out at a spot about 20 minutes from my house back in November, October. Uh, I was with Jay McGowan and Zach Coda. And uh, it was a spot that Crossbills had been at for about five months at that point. And it's a spot I have recorded at numerous times over the last 20 years. And it was fascinating because, you know, there were a lot of type tens, these Eastern tens around and a decent number of ones around. And this one lone type four bird flew in and it called for about 10 minutes. And after about 10 minutes, a flock of seven type tens, Eastern tens joined it. And they were in the top of the same tree, calling back and forth to one another. And after 10 minutes, it was almost as if like, you know, the, the tens were like, well, you're not my kind. And the four was like, you're not my kind. And the four flew off by itself in one direction. And these Eastern tens flew off in the opposite direction by themselves. Um, and it's, you know, it's stuff like that. You go, there's something going on here with these birds. You know, they act as good biological species or at least appear to act as good biological species for, you know, most of their lives, it seems. And, you know, and that's what the Finch Research Network is kind of really interested in, you know, the, the species that we're going to focus on, um, at least fundraise around the most for student projects, are this is this Red Cross Bill Complex the evening gross bee complex and then rosy finches in the west because we all know climate change is an issue and could we be losing the biodiversity that we don't even realize we're losing and I, I you know I'm not by nature somebody that thinks these birds should necessarily be split but I think they're birds these are complexes that you need to look at to see you know are there potentially cryptic species uh, involved in them um, like with the type nine being recognized uh, as a full species cash across bill. Type, type three is the most eruptive of all the cross bills in the east. Um, it doesn't seem to really get to Maine in big numbers most years. Um, like it seems to be in bigger numbers in Algonquin and the Adirondacks. I think it's just because it's coming from the west. And if it finds good habitat, it's going to stop there. Um, but when these birds come in big numbers, these type threes, uh, they become the most common crossbill call type. They are more common than these birds that we see in the east from year to year. It's a pretty squeaky sounding bird. And, you know, and they move here, as you can see in this map, there's kind of a core zone of occurrence where they're most abundant. And then a secondary zone of occurrence. And you can see this dashed line here where birds come in and out of every two or three to five years where they, they actually can become quite common. Um, they come here because the morphology of the cones in the Northeast are similar to the morphology of the cones in the Northwest. But it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're a small bill cross bill that likes hemlock to go to the Rockies where there's no hemlock. Here it is right here. It's kind of a zigzag down up. Here's another one right here. It's kind of squeaky sounding as well. But you can see the differences on the spectrograph. I 
And then type two is found, uh, it's the most eclectic in diet, most widespread in North America. It's never around in the East in any kind of big numbers really, but there's always some around in the East. Kind of sounds similar to type one though. Lower in frequency, kind of deeper sounding. So are there any questions at this point? Yes, Anybody there are. Any questions? Absolutely. All right, go ahead. So go Meg, ahead. Meg asks a great question. She wants to know, um, do these various crossbills have any physical differences? So we know that their calls are different. Are they physically different? Well, that's, that's the interesting thing is though they're cryptic species. They're kind of like, you know, you have like Pacific Wren and, and, and uh, you know, Winter Wren that was split. You know, there's been talk of the three or four, four different subspecies of, of white-breasted nuthatch could be split. So there are slight differences in bill sizes. Um, and those with that bill size means that there's a difference in efficiency for feeding on certain conifers in your home area. So some of these types are more common in the east, like I, you know, I said this northeastern bird or the Appalachian bird, but then like type two is most common in the, in the Rockies in Ponderosa Pine. Type three is most common in the Pacific Northwest. So there's slight differences in bill sizes. So there's three bill size classifications, small, medium, and large, but there's overlap. So they're cryptic. They're you really, if you put your bins on them, you know, like I can look at a flock of crossbills and sometimes you get these mixed oddballs mixed in with other cold types. And if you get a really large bill type two, and with a flock of other types, um, it will stick out. But again, you know, they're the same looking, you know, they're red looking, they're red birds, the males, the females are yellow, and you really would not know the difference if you didn't really weren't able to key into some things. Right. So any, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and Gail wants to know, are all these call, different call types considered dialects or is this leading to them being considered different subspecies? Well, so here's the thing. They're, you know, crossbills are this unique kind of, you know, braided complex that's caught in this suspended animation almost of, are they a species or are they not a species? They're not subspecies. By definition, subspecies are allopatric, meaning that ranges don't overlap. And you can have multiple coal types of red crossbills in the same area of breeding. There was a year in 2017, 18, Tim Spar and I drove around the Northeast, mainly New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, uh, recording birds in a breeding event. And there were four different coal types breeding that year. And we recorded what we felt confident of, of 117 pairs. And we only had six hybrid pairs in that group. So they're not subspecies by definition. Um, dialects is not a bad way of looking at it, but I don't know if it's necessarily accurate either. Um, but it's, it's, it's certainly, I can understand why people use that because I get that question often. Um, the deal is, is like, when crops crash in core zones, it forces these birds to move around, particularly the nomadic ones, and they come in contact with one another. And that's when, you know, mistakes can be made and hybridization can increase. Now, we were surprised in that event in 2017 and 2018 that we did not see a higher level of hybridization between the call types. But it's, a, it's a fascinating, endless, you know, it's, 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 it just never is boring to me. Um, and this is why we want to look into this, uh, you know, this complex even more. Hopefully that answers your question. So yeah. they're not, they're definitely not subspecies. Um, and, and, and I don't know if they'll ever really, some of the call types could end up being, become species like type nine was. Um, but they might end up being this, in this place where they're, they act as good biological species most of their lives, but under certain extreme environmental conditions, 
to come together in hybridization decreases and it keeps some level of gene flow there. Are there any DNA studies to support speciation theories? Uh, there has been an analysis of the genome, um, but not the whole genome. Um, and there are not great differences um, found in the crossbill complex. And that even holds true with white wings to a large degree. So just think of, you know, I mean, the thing is with these genome, you know, these genetic studies, you know, they're often presented as they're definitive. You know, while these, you know, the genetic testing becomes more sophisticated, are you, are you looking at the whole genome? Does, how much do you take into consideration RNA, um, which, you know, comes into the whole story with red pools, because there was the famous, uh, or the, the paper in 2015 that suggested they be lumped, which that actual, that study in 2015 on red pools, largely was from a flock of birds at my feeders. Um, so again, it's, it's, uh, there's been studies. I think it's a to be determined story though, it's called. It's a story that's still evolving. That's okay. the beauty of science though. People don't realize that we want to compartmentalize things, but what I find, I don't care if we ever split these birds, to tell you the truth. What I find endlessly fascinating is the messiness of science. And that's really what most science is, is messy. If you really let the birds determine the thing, because the birds can care less what we're calling them. But anyway, go ahead. Um, we've got one more question and then another one I can save till the end. But uh, Matthew asks, if one bird comes to Maine and discovers a favorable cone morphology, how does the news get back to the rest of the gang? We run that question by me again. So if one bird comes to Maine and discovers a favorable cone morphology, how yep. does news get back to the rest of the gang that there's good eating in Maine? Well, you know, they, the, so the, you think about it now, they, they develop nomadism, they evolved nomadism for a reason. And that was to be able to fly when they needed to, to survive. And so with like type three, that's, probably hardwired, in fact, I would say definitively hardwired for type three to go to the Northeast. They're not completely just nomadic. They, they're hedging their bets. Birds are gonna move to areas that they've been successful in in the past. So even though you might get a lone kind of, you know, sentinel type three in the Northeast, um, those birds are moving to the Northeast because that cone morphology is similar. And that is something I would be very surprised that that's not something they've evolved to do. So I think that hopefully answers the questions. Now, when birds hear one another, crossbills call to keep flock cohesion. And it's also to communicate, which quite frankly, I think finches have a lot they can teach us as far as working together with one another. Um, but when they descend on a tree, that, that when they start calling, they're calling to say to one another, hey, I'm not doing well over here, how about you? I'm not, I'm not finding a lot of food. And so that's why a lot of times when you hear crossbills or any of the finches for that matter, they will get louder just before they're about to fly off. And that's because they built through a crescendo where they, haven't been foraging successfully. And what they're saying to one another is, we gotta go somewhere else to get fruit. So hopefully that answers some more questions there. Sounds like a big rally cry. Let's do this. <laughs> it kind of is, All right, yes, go ahead. You can feel free to continue. All right, so the Finch Research Network, this is, you know, this is something that really has been, you know, in the works or at least in, as, as, as a mindset for about the last six, seven years. Um, I was actually out in Montana on the Victor Manual Nature Tour trip and I was talking to Denver all the time. And I was actually with the gentleman that I'm with going to see these Sandhill Cranes um, as well. And I said, what do you think of this idea? Because Denver started the Owl Research Institute, which is kind of the most similar model that the Finch Research Network is modeled after, although I want this to be more of a broad spectrum network. I want everybody to feel that 
they could have a, a, a role to play in this. I don't care if you're an enthusiast, a sound recordist, an artist, a hardcore scientist. Um, everybody could be a part of this. So, you know, what, what was happening was I realized there was a, some people that were traveling around North America and they were recording birds. And I said to myself, you know, I got to figure out a way to, to bring in some money to pay for travel, at least for people that are traveling around recording these birds. And so one thing kind of led to another, you know, here we are, we decided to launch this thing and, and our first, you know, kind of flagship project is this crossbow project. Now we have ARU units out across North America, um, which are autonomous recording units to collect some data to try to get into areas that we want to do some sort of mating uh, studies. So uh, again, we want everybody to kind of be part of this thing. And uh, it's been, you know, I guess maybe it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you can look at these things as karma in life. It's, you know, I launched this thing this year. And, and quite frankly, I mean, if you look at who really has popularized finches, you know, it was Ron Pittaway's finch forecast. I mean, you have no idea how many people I've heard, you know, they look for that forecast every year. And when it's not a great forecast, I've heard people literally say to me, it's almost like I go into a bit of a depression because I know the winter is going to be long. Um, but he popularized finches. And, you know, that's it's, it's great to have Tyler War, who is the new finch forecaster. Um, he's up. I'm the board of directors of the Finch Research Network. I got a professor at Cornell. I got a professor at SUNY, not SUNY, but uh, UC Davis in California. Tom Hahn, who's been studying crossbills and finches since the 80s, and Jamie Cornelius at Oregon State as well. Um, we, we gave some money to, some of you might know, there's been a wintering Grosbeak project at uh, uh, Powder Mill Avian Research Center and um, Western PA Land Conservancy uh, have been doing this past winter where they've been banding and tagging gross peaks. In fact, the study's been going on for a number of years. But we fundraised around that and uh, we gave some money to that project for, for more tagging. And that's the kind of stuff that we plan to continue to fundraise around. In fact, I'm, I'm talking to some students now about you know some bringing in some some funds to, you know, to fund a master's or PhD level uh, project as well. We were, I was asked to be on a rosy finch working group. So that's, you know, that's a species that's, you know, really, really, uh, there's some climate change concerns around that because, you know, like our big nails thrush here in the Northeast, you know, these birds really, you know, we've lost some big nails thrushes from the mountaintops here in the Northeast. You, you, as a, as a high altitudinal breeder, you can only go so far up a mountain with climate change. And eventually you're, you run out of habitat or you're out competed by other birds moving up the mountain to breed. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and it's been absolutely unbelievable. I, mean, I, I could not have you know, launched this in a better year than this year. And again, like I said, get involved, get a hold of me, you know, even if it's in some small way, whether you want to make a donation or you want to fund a project or a species or put in sound recordings. You know, Macaulay Library has over 11,000 Red Cross built recordings, you know, and that's partly or at least in, in large part to some degree um, because of this relationship I've been having with the greater burden community for a better part of two decades now. Um, and that is the most common uh, recorded species in Macaulay Library by 50%. The next closest species is like Carolina Wren at 7,000 recordings or 7,500 recordings, something like that. So, um, so as you can see here, these are the projects, you know, Red Cross Field Project. We have an assorted of mating project we hope to do. Uh, also, even gross beaks, I think, you know, sort of mating study in even gross beaks is even easier to approach because they don't erupt into areas where they come in contact as much, but there are some areas in North America where some of the cold types do come in contact with one another. And, you know, we also would like to look at possibly seeing are there, are there, is there some kind of boreal bird, boreal finch initiative 
you know, our committee had this talks with some of us, a handful of us now put the committee together to look at other ways of improving the predictive models of eruptions. You know, eruptions are largely driven again by this uh, high reproductive success and, you know, followed by a crash in the food. But what drives those cone crops is to the large part, you know, climatological data. So, you know, precipitation, temperature, um, these bloodworm outbreak, outbreaks obviously are a wild card in it. You know, there's concern. We want to put tags on bird because there's concern that maybe with increased, you know, global, you know, with temperatures in the boreal that birds, there's more rain events or freezing rain events in the boreal. And birds have a harder time thermoregulating under those conditions. So there could be higher mortality uh, during events like that. So again, we're, we're, you know, we're right at the beginning of the return flight. It's, you know, red poles will be with us for about maybe a month more, three weeks. Uh, pine growth peaks are pretty much have really kind of pulled back out. There's a few here and there. And the evening growth peak in Siskins and purple finches will be the next wave. Crossbills really won't move around and get back to the area that they typically reassort in until that new cone crop is developed. And that's in, you know, that really develops in, in May, June, July. Um, so they'll be with us around for a little bit longer, crossbills even. You know, and we, you know, public service wise, we, we, you know, it's one of the biggest things. It's been absolutely almost impossible to keep up with the number of recordings that have come in or the, photos of hoary red poles or green morph siskins um, that people have asked for help uh, identifying. And it's a big public service that we want to continue to provide the, the larger community birding and archaeological community and just identifying, you know, hoary red poles and uh, across the call types and so on. There's your hoary red pole shot right there. That was at my, that was at my feeder in 2013 right there. And this last statement here, we can be found at finchnetwork.org, also on Finch Masters on Facebook and Finch's Eruptions and Mass Crops. But this last statement here really sums up uh, my endless fascination with uh, crossbills for the last 25 years. Um, just fascinating, fascinating group. After that, that's, that's all I got. I'll take some more questions. Thank you so much. We do have some conservation related questions. So um, Jennifer asks that uh, how can this information um, help with Finch's con help with Finch conservation? And um, another question that's similar is how does this information inform conservation of Finch habitat? That's an, that's an excellent, excellent question. So, you know, what makes these birds so beloved in some ways is the mystery around them. They're uh, eruptive and unpredictable. So what we really need to try to do is get at what are the population numbers in the boreal? What are, you know, have eruption dynamics changed? Um, it, you know, the first 15 years in New York, you could almost count on biennial patterns of eruptive red poles and even gross peaks. And then the last eight years that got knocked out of whack. So what knocks that stuff out of whack? And is there a way to key in on that so we can maybe do something about it? I don't know. I mean, it's a big, big question from a conservation perspective. Um, clearly, you know, protecting habitat where the, the cash or cross still is found is key. There's a major conservation crisis with honey creepers in Hawaii, and those are actually from gillid finches as well. In fact, the, the belief is, you know, that a flock of, of rose finches from Europe wandered possibly in an eruptive event to the Hawaiian Islands five million years ago, and then they evolved into 54 species of honey creepers, which there's only 20 of them left. So, you know, the conservation things are hard to solve, but you've got to study them to figure out, try to figure out what's going on, and then see what you can do about it. Um, can you protect, you know, conifer forests more? Can you manage the conifer forests 
uh, better because the more mature the conifer forest, the better or more reliable the cone crop is. Um, is there, you know, there's been a debate between some scientists of, you know, budworm, you know, gross beaks, even gross beaks fell off, you know, 90% over the last 50 years. Budworms on the increase, you know, so here's a COVID silver lining for everybody. They weren't able to treat the budworm outbreak in Canada last year, which has led to continuously led to higher numbers of evening gross peaks. You know, and that, you know, I, these are hard decisions because, you know, you have this, you know, even gross peaks in, in the boreal forest, you get this budworm outbreak that's killing, you know, an important, you know, tree or, or, or monetary source for, for Canada and they treat that forest so it, those trees don't die. But on the flip side, even gross peaks have decreased for a number of years. I mean, the reason why we're also seeing more Cape May warblers the last few years is because of the budworm outbreak there. So these are complex questions. Uh, you know, I think you gotta just, you gotta study them before you can try to get some better insight to them and then maybe do something about it. You know, this is an age old question with climate change. Are we gonna ever really, you know, we, we tend to do this pendulum swing on, you know, in, this, in, the, in the United States or around the world of, you know, do you do something about climate change? Do you not do something about climate change? Depending on, you know, who might be in, 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 in authority at that time. So, um, I, you know, that's not maybe the perfect answer, but it, it's, you know, these aren't solved overnight. Um, conservation though is where it's at. It's where my heart really lies. Um, you know, habitat protection, I'm on, I'm on, a, I'm also a, a board chair of a wetland trust and I'm a, I'm a bit of an orchid, uh, Northeastern orchid expert too. So um, I'm big on conservation and uh, we just gotta keep studying these things to see if we can uh, find out what's going on and maybe actually impact policymakers. I mean, that's the only way to really get anywhere with conservation. And that, I, data, that data collection is so so essential. Um, so essential. And, and, and not only that, you know, I have a little bit and I don't want this to come across the wrong way. I have a little bit, I think we scientists need to do, I'm kind of a hybrid. I love natural history stories. I'm also a social worker. I work with people. I've been studying birds. I did 15 years at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I launched this Finch Research Network. We need to do a better job as scientists effectively communicating with the masses and connecting people to nature. I think we've seen that with COVID some where everybody realized that, that, that there was in this inherent connection to nature that we've, some of us rediscovered again. Um, but the more you can effectively can communicate with the masses, because everybody has this connection, I don't care what your political affili you know, affiliation is. If you can connect with people on individual levels, from a, you know, from a nature perspective, you can make a difference. You can start to turn that tide where people will care. Absolutely. Yeah. And organizations like yours and organizations like the, you know, Midcoast Audubon and even the library, yeah. I think, are just doing such a great job making these access to resources and information so much more accessible um, through things yeah. like these types of Zoom programs. We do have um, we do, stories. Go ahead. I was going to say, we do have two uh, questions left, and I want to get to those real quick before we go because we're a little bit past seven. Um, but uh, Sherry says, there are various other evolutionary complexes. One well-known example is the Ensantia, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, Asatina, Asatina uh, complex in, Calif in California salamanders. Is there some similar environmental barrier linked with migration that may be leading to the variants? Some, say that last two parts of that again. Okay, so I'll, I'll say that. I apologize for not being able to. It works in Mount St. Helens, by the way, so go ahead. So she asks, there are other various evolutionary complexes. One well-known example is the Ensatina complex in California salamanders. Is there some similar environmental barrier linked with migration that may be leading to these variants? Man, that is a complex, complex question. So. All right, I'm going to bring it a little bit back to the east. There's a similar thing here going on in the east with some of the ambistoma 
salamanders as well, where you have these tetraploids and, you know, uh, with Jefferson's blue spotted and uh, there's a couple other salamanders too. I, you know, migration is a whole different ball of wax with herbs because there it tends to be very linear and local. You know, birds fly. So, you know, and, and there's also hybridization in, in a lot of these herbs. Uh, in areas of contact. So I don't know if I can give you a great answer there. Uh, salamanders are fascinating. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can give you an answer there. That's a tough That's a tough question. It's not really, it's a different dynamic. I mean, it's local and it's linear and they, they, they can't fly, obviously. Mm -hmm. So barriers there, um, the barriers are broken down, obviously. You know, maybe they've come in contact in more recent times so i uh, yeah i'm sorry i can't necessarily it's answer okay. that no thank you um it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, i'll keep thinking about it though the, <laughs> the last question i think is a great one to end on um daniel says with the breeding success of these species this past year and the resulting increase in population is there any reason to expect a similar eruptive event next winter so what do we have to yeah. look forward to yeah so so you know, here's the, here's the thing with that. You know, you numbers are higher. Um, I think the budworm outbreak is not going to just disappear. It's going to be ongoing. So we had two big outbreaks of budworm in North America. Evening grosbeaks were not originally a northeastern bird, by the way. Um, it's not until just recent, you know, the last hundred years um, that they became more of an eastern bird. Um, and the thing is, is you know. With, with moving forward here, they did not treat part of the boreal forest for budworm. And I think we are gonna see a bit of a period here where we have an uptick in some finches. We're not gonna have a complete bust. Now it's gonna be definitely a much lower year next year. There is a, by nature, a natural cyclical biennial nature to uh, these eruptions. Um, but I think what we'll see is maybe an echo flight next year which means a small flight, and then probably two years from now, we'll see a bigger flight again. So, but once that, you know, budworm outbreak is treated, you know, there, there could be some decreases there. We might be in a period again where there's not these big eruptions. But, you know, that remains to be seen. That's what makes them fascinating, and that's why we're studying them. That's why we want to try to improve the predictive models. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, again, finchnetwork.org, if you would like more information about these projects that um, Matt's been discussing in this study. Uh, I also encourage you to visit um, the Midcoast Audubon website and, of course, the Camden Public Library's website for more programs related to uh, birds, nature, and a zillion other things. Um, if you enjoyed the program this evening and would like to watch a recording of it, you'll be able to find it by tomorrow on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel channel. Uh, if you have any difficulty, just email me and I'm happy to send you the link. All right, folks, thank you so much. And Matt, good luck with the rest of your trip. And I hope you have an amazing time with the Sandhill Cranes. I hope everybody you know, enjoyed this though. So I know I did. Yes, we're having a lot of nice comments coming in thanking you. Um, and again, cool. I know this was a big deal to, to pull together. So thank you for your hard work yes, and, and this great presentation today. Yes, All right, we appreciate it. Thank you Thank so much. You. Yeah, keep Stay supporting training. the research network. Yes. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Good night. Good night.